how would you tackle Trendelenburg Gate? Whew. Well, I probably wouldn't tackle that person because you get sued, but I got some ideas about it, don't you worry. We first gotta look at, well, what the heck is Trendelenburg Gate? A Trendelenburg Gate occurs when someone takes a step and they can't keep their hips level, the hips drop down. So normally during gait, the glute meads help keep the pelvis level as you're walking. And so if there's a situation where the glute med isn't working as well, which generally the two instances that that happens is if there is some type of injury to the L5 nerve because that innervates the glute med, um, that can lead to the Trendelenburg gait happening. That would be one instance. The other instance is a Trendelenburg gait is very common after a total hip replacement, especially if it's a posterior approach, which is why I absolutely detest the posterior total hip replacement. Folks, don't do that one. If you need a total hip, well, consult your physician, of course. I'm just some silly PT on the internet, but I would probably tell most of my Supreme clientele to try to either go with an anterior or a lateral. There could be some other approaches that are newer, but the posterior, because they cut through all the glute tissue, ugh, I hate it. So a lot of times though, with a, with a posterior approach, they might cut the glute med on accident. And then now you, you don't have these muscles creating the stability to be able to uh, keep the pelvis level. And that is kind of whack. So you might be dealing with those types of things. If you have any type of tissue interventions that can help those people, you might want to go with that. So, you know, if there's some severe nerve compromise, uh, you probably want to get that checked out. If, you know, someone cut the glute med or they have a glute med tear, you might want to get that checked out and see if there's something that can be done about that. So once you've got all that squared away though, what the heck can we do from a movement perspective? Again, we have to look at, well, well, when does that Trendelenburg gate happen? And also think about this folks, when would it be useful? We don't think about like these compensatory strategies or these, you know, undesirable biomechanical things that we may see as being useful. But really they are because you can still walk with the Trendelenburg gait. A Trendelenburg gait, when the hip drops, that occurs at mid stance. And in mid stance, I have to be able to open up the pelvic outlet to some extent to create an adduction and internal rotation action. And guess what folks, if I can do that, my pelvis can be level. If I can't do that and I ask that person, I say, hey person, I still need you to get in the mid stance, what you gonna do about it? And they might be like, oh, well snap. I don't really know how to create that opening action through the pelvic outlet because I can't ascend the anterior pelvic diaphragm. Oh, I got an idea. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to orient the pelvis as a unit just like that. Because now, instead of getting the relative motions to happen at the pelvis, well, heck, if I just droop the pelvis down like that, now I can adduct and internally rotate the pelvis and life is good. Or is it? Well, Trendelenburg gate ain't gonna have you walking all wild and cool. So we probably wanna do things to see if we can restore that relative motion that is needed. Because what happened is can't ascend Pelvic diaphragm, still got to adduct and internally rotate. Boom, Trendelenburg, that's what happens. So for these folks, if you have a Trendelenburg gait, what could be useful, aside from stack, that's always going to be there, so please stack, check it out, is doing things where you can teach the anterior thrust or the anterior pelvic diaphragm to ascend, which is going to open up the pelvic outlet. That's associated with restoring internal rotation. So you want to do things that are going to promote the internal rotation component of the gait cycle. You know, folks, like classically, before we kind of got into all the stuff that we're talking about right now, a lot of times people would do standing hip hike exercises to create um, some functional glute strength to help reduce the Trendelenburg sign. And now that I think about it, they were kind of in the right direction with that. 
but maybe not for the reasons that we thought. Because when I'm working some of those frontal plane exercises, well, folks, that's helping me do some of the stuff that needs to occur in mid stance, namely, ascend the pelvic diaphragm. So doing some of those hip hike activities, and in fact, the ones that I like would be like a right squat, left hip hike, where I'm squat squatting on the right leg and I hike that left side up. Well, crap, that could be a really good move for helping to restore the opening of the pelvic outlet that should occur in mid stance. So anything that is in more the frontal plane side of things can be really useful in that sense. And those would be some of the big things that I would probably focus on. So the sideline stride exercise I talked about previously, that right hip hike activity, anything like that can be really good at getting these dynamics to occur. Also too, if you can do stuff that helps promote more internal rotation, whether it's mid depth squatting or anything like that, that can also be an excellent way to help increase the movement that should be occurring when it comes to the Trendelenburg gait. And so those would be the big things. Obviously, you wanna make sure that you're getting any of the structural stuff checked out that oftentimes happens with the Trendelenburg issue. But if you can do things that increase internal rotation, that's probably going to be really useful.